Welcome to the third lecture in our series on abortion, where we cover the standard abortion debate, Mary Ann Warren's pro-choice argument, Judith Jarvis Thompson's pro-choice argument, Patrick Lee's pro-life argument, and Don Marquis' pro-life argument. In this lecture, we're covering Judith Jarvis Thompson's pro-choice argument. So let's take a look at it. Uh, Th Thompson thinks that she has a way forward in the abortion debate since she doesn't rely on the common argument strategies. Remember, the uh, common argument strategy is for the pro-lifer to say that the fetus is a human being and maybe even a person, for the pro-choicer to deny that the fetus is a person. And Thompson says, well, I'll grant the pro-lifer whatever they want. The fetus is a human being, the fetus is a person, the fetus has the same moral status as adult human beings or human persons. But she argues that even still, abortion is sometimes permissible. She argues that some abortions are still permissible since the morality of abortion does not depend on the nature of the fetus, but its relation to its mother. If you recall, Marianne Warren focuses on the nature of the fetus. She says, you have to determine what it is to be a human being, and you have to ask, is the fetus a human being? And um, that she takes to be the fundamental question of the abortion debate. But Thompson disagrees. She thinks, no, there's a special relationship the fetus has to its mother that changes the morality of the situation in spite of the nature of the fetus. So to get intuitions going, she gives a thought experiment. A violinist is. So you wake up in the morning, um, and, and this is from her article. Sorry, this is from her article, um, an, <clears throat> A Defense of Abortion. You wake up in the morning and find yourself in bed with a famous unconscious violinist. He has a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Musical Love, Music Lovers has found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours, so your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood. The director of the hospital tells you, look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known, but still they did it. And the violinist now is plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him, but it's only for nine months. By then, he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. So the idea is you were kidnapped, you were plugged in somehow to this violinist so that he's using your kidneys. You have to have this situation for nine months until his kidneys will recover. And if you unplug from the violinist at any point before that, well, he's going to die. He'll experience kidney failure and he'll die. So then the question is, you know, um, is are you obligated to stay plugged in to the violinist? So Thompson thinks that a person would not be obligated to remain hooked up to the violinist. Like she says, if you unplug and you walk away, you haven't done anything wrong. You're not obligated to stay there. And um, I would want to know what you think. Are you morally obligated to stay uh, plugged into the violinist? You might say it's permissible to unplug. You might say it's impermissible to unplug, in which case to do the right thing, you'd have to stay there all nine months. Or you might say, I don't know. What Thompson thinks you should say is that it is permissible to unplug. And on that basis, she gives an argument that abortion is okay. So she says, being hooked up to the violinist is analogous to having an unwanted pregnancy. One is not morally required to remain hooked up to the violinist. Therefore, one is not morally required to carry pregnancy to term. So she thinks that the situation with the violinist, however obscure or bizarre that is, is analogous to being pregnant. And if you can walk away from the violinist and let him die, you can have an abortion. And in neither case have you done anything wrong. So what do we think of this argument? Well, uh, well let's continue on with what Thompson thinks. She thinks that you would not be obligated to remain hooked up to the violinist because a violinist does not have a moral right to your body. Similarly, a pregnant woman is not obligated to carry a fetus to term because a fetus does not have the moral right to the woman's body, so says Thompson. So in neither case does the entity have a moral right to your body, and the moral principle that justifies this is this. Nobody is morally required to make large sacrifices of health, of all other interests and concerns, of all other duties and commitments to keep another person alive. If that, Since that's what you're doing in the violinist case, since that's what you're doing in cases of pregnancy, well then... Uh, you know, this principle says that you're not required to do it. 
let's respond to Thompson. Do we think that um, you can unplug from the violinist? Do we think the violinist case is analogous to pregnancy? Because this is an argument by analogy. And the way you respond to arguments by analogy is you, one way is you try to find dis, disanalogies between the two cases. The one case being the violinist case, the other case being cases of pregnancy. Are they somehow different that, in a way that's morally important or significant? Another way to respond to arguments by analogy is to give counter analogies. So she gives a violinist case. What if you propose a different case where that case is more similar to pregnancy than the violinist case? And you can say that, well, in this new case, it's not permissible to kill. So in pregnancy, it's not permissible to kill. We'll see an example of this later on. Uh, so if you didn't understand, it's OK. We'll, we'll, we'll come across an, an example. So let's start with disanalogies, tacit consent. Um, some say that you do not give tacit consent in the violinist case, but you do in normal cases of pregnancy. So you definitely don't give consent or tacit consent in the violinist case because you were kidnapped. Uh, tacit consent, uh, what is that? It's something like you know the consequences of what you're doing and you do it anyway. And in doing so, you tacitly accept the consequences. Okay, so for example, in normal cases of pregnancy, you voluntarily engage in intercourse knowing the potential consequences. So you act knowing the potential consequences of your actions and you uh, therefore should accept the consequences of your actions. So in the violinist case, you don't give tacit consent, but in normal cases of pregnancy, you do. Two, you are not responsible for the violinist situation and need for aid, but you are responsible for the fetus's situation and the need for aid. So you did nothing to put this violinist in this situation. It's his kidney. That's the problem. And you aren't in, under any obligation to help him with his kidney ailment, but you are the one who, with another person, created, oh, excuse me. You are the one who, with another person, created the fetus, created its need for aid. Um, so doesn't that give you more responsibility for um, seeing it through to a point of maturity, seeing it through its time of need and getting it out of that situation of need? Three, you do not bear parental responsibilities to the violinist, but you do for the fetus. Now, parental responsibilities seem to give you special moral obligations. So if the violinist were drowning and your baby were drowning and you could only save one, most people would say not only that you've done nothing wrong if you save your baby and not the violinist, but that you have a moral obligation. You must save your baby instead of the violinist. Remember, you can only save one. So you do have special parental obligations to your children that you don't have to strangers. So I don't have an obligation to feed you, to clothe you. I don't have an obligation to house you, but I do have an obligation to house, feed, clothe my children. Um, and the difference is uh, parental attachment. So you definitely don't bear those responsibilities to violinists, but you do for the fetus. And for, in the violinist case, unplugging is allowing him to die. How does a violinist die? Not because you unplug. His kidneys fail. But in abortion, you kill a fetus, even if through an intermediary, the abortion doctor. So killing is definitely worse than letting die. Um, what is what is allowing to die? You're, you're not the cause, but you do not prevent. Whereas killing, you are the cause or you sanction the cause. So let me let me show you that killing is worse than letting die. So you see someone drowning. Um, if you don't step in to save them, they'll die. But you probably haven't done anything morally wrong if you don't jump into the water and save the person. Why? Well, because in order to do so, you'd have to risk your life. But maybe we don't have a moral obligation to risk our lives in order to save the lives of anyone else. It might be a good thing to do, but it's not obligatory. But suppose you see someone drowning and you take like a long stick and you hold them under with the stick. Now you've actively killed them. So in the one case, you don't save them, you allow them to die. In the other case, you actively kill them. And like actively killing them was worse or is worse than allowing them to die. 
And in the violinist case, you are allowing him to die because he dies of kidney failure, not your direct uh, as a result of your direct action. Whereas in abortion, you kill the fetus through that intermediary um, because uh, abortion definitely is the kill, um, intentional killing involves the intentional killing of the fetus. Okay, so those are the disanalogies. And if those disanalogies work, then it would undermine the strength of her argument because, uh, you know, it would undermine the similarity between the two cases. And therefore, um, just because in the one case you can walk away, it doesn't mean in the other case you can as well. So let me give you a counter analogy. So remember, a counter analogy involves offering a new analogy that's more like the like the more like pregnancy than the original analogy is. So it's the modified violinist case. And you you can take modified case number one and modified case number two and you can combine them. So imagine a person who freely chooses to join the society of music lovers, knowing that there's a one in a hundred, or it doesn't really matter, one in a thousand, one in ten thousand chance of being plugged into the violinist if she joins the society. She certainly does not desire to be plugged into the violinist, but at the same time, she desires to join the society and feels the one in a hundred odds are an acceptable risk. She go, goes ahead and joins, and much to her chagrin, her name is selected as the person to be plugged in to the violinist. Is it, is it unreasonable to say that she has waived her right to control over her own body? I think not. The idea here is that, you know, in the original violinist case, you're kidnapped, but in this case, you, you go, uh, you join this society knowing that your name might be chosen to be plugged, but for you to be plugged into the violinist. Now, if you join that society, you're consenting to being plugged into the violinist. And that seems more analogous to regular cases of pregnancy where you have intercourse knowing the consequences. And then the modified violinist case too, in order to disconnect from the violinist, you must first unambiguously kill him rather than allow him to die. Perhaps you tear the limbs off of the violinist one by one before finally putting a syringe into his brain and crushing his skull, right? So this is more like cases of um, abortion than um, just unplugging and letting him die. Okay, so that is our, that is Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument and the uh, responses. And next we'll move on to the pro-choice, I mean, sorry, the pro-life arguments.